going to go ahead and, and pick up here with, the, uh, with our next panel. You know, one of the issues that tends to come up year after year when we're doing these conferences, you know, we want to work with employers. How, you know, how would this work with an employer? How does a doctor engage an employer? Uh, we've had uh, TPAs come up here and talk to us, and the questions always come up, well, how do you engage with the TPA? How do you even start doing something like this? Do you have any data? And what, would it, what might it look like if an employer were to do this, this sort of thing? How might this work in a rural environment? Uh, well, this panel is the culmination of, of many of those questions that's happened over the years. So what we'd like to do is uh, share our experience as to how we're using direct primary care integrated within a self-funded employer health plan uh, in a rural community in, in Florida about an hour and a half from here, about an hour and a half from here. Uh, and also uh, we're gonna hear some information about how a, a practice also integrated with a county uh, employee health plan in Anderson County in South Carolina. So our panel today consists of myself. You're going to get sick of hearing from me by the end of the day already. Uh, Mr. Carl Schusler. Carl uh, works in the employee benefits space. He is a consultant to health plan design. Uh, he's out of Atlanta, Georgia. Ms. Lois Hilton, she's the director of human resources for DeSoto Memorial Hospital, a rural 49-bed hospital uh, in DeSoto County, Florida. And Dr. Shane Purcell, everyone knows Dr. Purcell. Uh, he is a direct primary care practice in Anderson, South Carolina. So I'm going to go ahead and just kick it off to, uh, to Carl Schuster and let him jump right in. I'm a walker, so I'm going to walk around a little bit. Hope I don't trip. Um, it's a, I, I, want to, I want to thank the uh, Docs for Patients Care Foundation. I want to thank the Physicians Foundation for giving us the opportunity to share our story. Um, this is a, a group of people that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've grown to love the DPC model. My father was a 40-year practicing OBGYN in Macon, Georgia. I know I sound like I'm from New York, but um, <laughs> that works every time. Um, but anyway, before I get started, big game tomorrow, and I'm here. Uh, I was, Dr. Gross had asked me to come, and I mean, I didn't know what to do with my schedule. And a couple of weeks ago, there was a big football game down in Jacksonville. And uh, it, it's now been 1,112 days since my Georgia Bulldogs lost to those stinking tank top jort wearing Florida Gators. And we're, we play Auburn tomorrow, so I'm going to say a go dogs. Playing them for the 124th time since 1892, the oldest rival in the Deep South. So anyway, all right, we'll get started. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you guys can acquire clients. That seems to be an issue around the country we hear about. So I'm going to speak to that just a little bit. Um, you have to educate yourself and really become a student of the game. You guys have to immerse yourself into it. You're getting into an industry with jokers like me that really don't work like I do that uh, all these folks have encountered in the past. So we're going to talk more about that. Knowledge is power. Become a voracious reader. Read the following books. These are great books. Take a, if you've got a camera, each time you snap a picture of these slides, I get 10 bucks. So, <laughs> Take a minute and get pictures. This is a book called The CEO's Guide to Restoring the American Dream. We're all part of the Health Rosetta, and uh, it's a group of advisors that are forward-thinking that get DPC and how to integrate it into a self-funded health plan. There's a couple of us here today, Jonathan Estes and George Clausen over here, who are new Health Rosetta advisors. So these are the kind of people you want to try to look for when you're, when you're out pursuing clients. Here's the other books. I'm not going to spend much time because I don't have a lot of time. But all these are great books. Anybody have heard of Dr. Marty McCary? He's been a guest on Dr. Shear's uh, and, and Dr. Uh, Mike's uh, Doctor's Lounge. These are great books. They tell the story. And I'll tell you, Unaccountable really changed my career as a benefits advisor. And it's written by a physician. And I won't get into all the details. There's a, a TV show called The Resident. that's a takeoff on that book. And my father read it and ver verified and validated many of the things in that book. because. You always wonder, but it's very good. And Dr. McCary's done a ton of good work out there. You may have heard about the University of Virginia hospital system that was putting liens on people's homes. He got that all turned around and has been real responsible and part of the movement. All these are great books. Y'all get them and, and read them. Um, the biggest roadblocker is folks like, well, not me, but they're called brokers. They slog insurance. They push insurance. They're typically... As I say, they all aren't created equal as you guys aren't created equal. Not every DPC doc's equal. Some are hybrid, some aren't. And not every physician's created equal. Um, I, I grew up in a town where I used to work at a golf course, and my father was a 
as a set of practicing OB Joanne, I said, Pop, you're never at the golf course. And he had three partners, and there was a single solo practice in OB-GYN who was always at the golf course. But he's a terrible golfer, too, on top of that. And I said, Dad, why is, why is this guy always here? Why aren't you? And he said, well, son, his C-section rate's 50% and mine's 15. Not all doctors are created equal. So the same with brokers, the same thing with you guys. Find bro benefits advisors who are not 1099 employees of the BUCAs. Anybody know what a BUCA is? Blue Cross, United, Signet, and Humana. With the, in our world, we have all these acronyms. Most of the brokers, a lot of them, are 1099 employees of the BUCAs because they place business a lot of times based on bonuses they get from them. We don't work like that. Many of the other people I'll talk to you about don't as well. You need to find benefit advisors who are population health managers. That's what we do. We don't sell insurance. I'll, we'll talk to Lois. I don't think we really sold any insurance with, with the hospital. We built a health plan and we have tools in place to help them manage the risk of their health plan. So find people that do that. And I can help you with this. We have 140 advisors. So if you're DPC and uh, you know, Tupelo, Mississippi, we probably have someone that we can connect you with. All right. Just quickly, this is going to be real confusing for, uh, for a lot of folks, but this is what we're trying to get to. Does this model work, folks? This used to work. This is Marcus Welby, MD, as I call it. And if you don't know who that is, go Google it. I'm obviously getting older. Nobody laughed. So anyway, um, you've got your primary care, your direct primary care, and your specialist. You've got a pharmacist, and you've got the member you want to take care of. And as we said, healthcare is local, so that's the local care team. Then you've got the employer. Then you've got folks like us that are there. And just the third-party administrator, the claim analytics, I'm just, it gets real complicated. The pharmacy benefit manager, PBM, also stands for Program Bilking Millions. <laughs> um, pharmacy consultant, and then your utilization management, disease management, case management. How many of y'all ever heard of prior art or pre-cert? Y'all love that, right? We've, we customize programs where you don't have to do all that. So anyway, long story short, the real critical person is you guys make, make calls and meet employers. You're going to want to, you're going to talk to the employer, but you're going to run into that, that broker and that broker will derail you all day long because here's why. Seven years ago, I would have been like that. Well, we, Carl, what do you think about this? This doctor's doing this service. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, you don't want to do that. And the person you're meeting, the owner of the business or someone, you know, there, they're running the business. So at, once you're out the door, they're on to something else. They call us and we say, eh, you don't want to do that. Because it's real easy to only meet twice a year with a client and cash a check. Can't play golf. You play golf a lot more that way and you can hunt or whatever you enjoy doing. So what we've tried to do is simplify this and get it like this. That's the real, you want the, you want the uh, medical plan participant, the patient, and the employer. So they're a hurdle in this process. You have to identify the right one so you can get in the door. Is that clear to everybody? Does anybody have any questions? Clear as mud? Okay. All right, so here's a, a better example of how it works. You guys are the quarterback. You guys need to be in the center of the health plan for the employer. And then the patient. Then all the other areas that you have to, that y'all have to refer patients to and use for the care of the, of the employee. Then you've got a third party administrator that processes the claims. And I'll say one other thing. There is no such thing as a payer. Anybody ever heard of a payer? There is no payer. The only payer is the employer and employee. Those folks are processors. They're not payers. So let's get that straight. So that's a third party administrator, self-funded benefit plan, all the other services you guys refer patients to for. So what you do is you, 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 make, you uh, prescribe a drug to the member. It goes to the third-party administrator, and they get all the information, fill data, et cetera. Then they will let the direct primary care doctor know when their gaps in fill. If the patient hasn't been back to see the DPC, they can find out through this TPA communicating with them. And you've got to be careful in the TPA selection. That's what we're here to help with. And I know this is pretty confusing, but then you've got your facilities claims that come in, and then they're communicating with a direct primary care doctor, too, on the claims data and sharing that. And then again, they're educating on the appropriateness of care. 
And again, communicating with the third party administrator and then back to the direct primary care. So you see that you guys are the quarterback. You guys are the whole value creator to, to us of the system. You make it work. You take care of people. I wish I could do what you did. I took biology 101 at the University of Georgia, the Harvard of the South, and um, that wasn't supposed to be funny. I mean, that's not, that was serious. Um, I took biology and I said, this isn't for this kid. So it didn't work for me. But again, my father, my daughter is a junior in nursing school at Augusta University. So she's, she's, she's doing great and loves it. So anyway, this is what it works. So the whole goal is for y'all to steer the member to the right care. I know that's a little complicated, but I wanted you to see kind of how it's supposed to work. All right. You got to find benefit advisors that understand DPC and know how to integrate them in a plan. Uh, a fellow by the name of Sean Pruner introduced us to Dr. Lee Gross, and everybody knows who Dr. Gross is. And he had heard we had this program called the Fair Cost Health Plan that we had built that would, could integrate and make this work. But you got to find those brokers that understand DPC. Okay, is everybody clear on that? Find the advisor that does that. And not broke, you don't want a broker, you want an advisor. And then take them on meetings with you. Dr. Gross and I went on a bunch of meetings at the hospital, and they just didn't seem to figure out to hire us. It took a long time, and we were working on them, you know, and I'm just kidding. Um, uh, um, but it, that's a long story. But Dr. Gross is the one that took us. Who's ever walked in my shoes showing up with a physician? And who's ever been in my shoes show up with a doctor? That's the way it works. We can help you, if you find the right advisor, help you get that message across. Because again, you walk in without knowing all the components. Dr. Gross was well versed in how this industry works, which is why he could never found anyone that could help because everyone was a roadblock. We can be a gate to help y'all. You gotta find the right person. And then build a community marketing plan. I will be glad to email any of you that comes up or actually y'all call Lee Gross and ask him and bother him and leave me alone. Um, no, I'm glad to help, just joking. But if you'll send me an email or give me a card, I'll send you this file, this Excel chart that will help you build a plan. You guys have got to get in your community, and you guys are the magnets and the leaders of the community, and you have the contacts with the employers, CPAs, civic leaders, and those people. And you need to go see them. But take someone with you, and that's where you can get somewhere. And if you build the plan right, here's a couple of examples. I'm not going to go through it. I don't have time. Am I doing all right, Lee? I got the scat. Okay. This is, a, this is a great tool, and again, I'll be glad to give it to you, where you go in and you fill these charts out. Who the organization name is, website, how you know them, et cetera. Get to people. I would have never met the Soto Memorial if it hadn't been for, for Sean and it hadn't been for Dr. Lee Gross. I would have never known him. If I called Lois, she goes, who are you? What, what's wrong with your voice? What's wrong? Well, you don't talk right, son. And she wouldn't have even talked to me. So... Anyway, here's some other things, just some more charts. I just want to give you all an example. But you've got to think, and you've got to look at who you know in your communities and then work on a strategy to outreach them. At least where I grew up, I grew up my town is about 150,000 people. The physicians are highly respected. They know people. You guys know people, and if you're in smaller communities, you certainly know more of them. And it's all local, so if you do that and you have a local flavor, we can help partner you with a good benefits advisor that is knowledgeable, that can help you and, and communicate your message. Any questions? Speak at relevant uh, uh, local events. Talk to local groups. I know that uh, Dr. Gross and Dr. Crouch, I also want to mention Dr. Crouch and Ann Horner in the back. They're a significant part of this practice that has worked with this hospital. They've done a great job. They speak to local groups within that community of Arcadia. It's about an hour and, like, at least about an hour and 50 minutes from here. And then organize an event with a benefits advisor. Work on a joint event with them. And we can help with the presentation. I'm, I mentor people all around the country trying to help them uh, get a little further along. And then find the local business coalitions. All right. Any questions? Same to the end. Do I? Same for the end. Okay. All right. It's pretty tough to follow. I mean, I thought I was blunt. I thought I heard Bernie. Wasn't that great? Um, They've heard me. I'll get to the bluntness in a minute. All right. Key things. Build employer-built health care versus insurer-built health care. We're going to cover that in a minute. I'm going to fly through these. Active management versus passive management. 
You can't passively manage your risk. So when you're a DPC doctor, that's why finding one of us is important because we can help you actively manage your risk. We're going to get into that in a minute. Relocalized care. Healthcare is local. It's not national. It's local. It all starts local. It starts with all of y'all in this room. Y'all are the key cog to the wheel. Focus on building community-owned health care instead of insurer-owned health care. That's what Lois and, and Dr. Gross and Dr. Crouch, that's what they're doing down there in Arcadia, and we're going to talk to that. And then the local care team, as I said, you have to eliminate all these counterproductive, who likes calling insurance companies and dealing with all that stuff? My father, just quickly, it was uh, right before I went off to Georgia, I remember it was before managed care hit, my mother had a bumper sticker on a car that said, my doctor, my choice. And y'all know what happened after all of that. Well, they're not in the network. I'm not going to them anymore. So again, get it back local. And I call it the Marcus Welby MD days. And if you watch how Dr. Crouch and Dr. Gross practice, and I'm sure many of you do, that's what they do. That's the difference. They're going to tell you stories. I'll start crying if I tell you some of the stories. Uh, if you actively manage your plan, you can offer 10 times the benefits for half the cost. DeSoto's benefits or so they're, they're so rich, they're about 46% of the cost. They're better than most health plans you're going to find around. If you look at the community they live in, much better than what the governmental entities offer. And it can be done. And then this is critical. There's a way if you have health insurance, your way and on your terms. And one of the things we said this week, we had our benefit education meetings there. Benefits are often done to the employees, not for the employees. What we've tried to do there with Lois and all the team's help is their benefits for the employees, not done to them. Does that, does that make sense? That's not a good question to ask, right? Because if it doesn't make sense, then you might think you're not. All right. All right. If you want to hear more, if you had not heard enough from my mouth, you can go tune in the podcast that was done back in February about this before we got to where we are. And a lot of the things we talked about somewhat came true, thankfully because uh, I, I tend to get a little exagger a little fired up, and so it worked out. So real quick, Vince Seek is the CEO, Dan Hogan is the CFO, and Lois is the HR director. Lois it, and her team are significant in this. If you don't have good leadership in these organizations that you're going to call on, it's hard to make change. And so I, they get a lot of credit for this. They're a state hospital district, 49-bed hospital, uh, about 160 employees on the plan now. When we met them, it was 157. Um, some of the challenges, it was the fourth poorest county in Florida, per capita income, 25,406. The Bucas were extracting millions from the community. Let's take a walk and take a peek at this. Anybody ever seen the Fortune 500? I want you to look at this. And if Bernie Marcus didn't get you fired up, this ought to get you pretty fired up. I want you to look at these companies in the top 25. And I also want to point out this, that the DOJ allowed Cigna and Express Scripts to merge. They allowed Aetna and CVS to merge. Look at where United ranks. United owns 630 companies. One of them is Optum, which is the largest owner of you, over 50,000 docs, and they just secured a $50 million, billion dollar contract last fall, at least for a piece of it. Okay? Wake up. This is what Bernie was talking about. You got to do something about this. And when you work with these organizations, it's very hard for your health plan to win. All right. Any questions? I know. Save them to the end. Passively managed risk when we, when we, met, when we met Lois and her team. And guys, this is huge. They lost obstetrics in February of 18. People got to drive an hour. We did a podcast about this. I don't know if anybody saw it. We broadcast from a deer stand back on the Georgia-Florida game. Um, that's a whole nother day on the story. I was supposed to wear my camo, but it's too hot down here to wear all that stuff. But anyway, they lost obstetrics. They couldn't afford it. It's a real problem. And the foreign medical spend, that's the spend that the members, that the employees of the hospital went away from the hospital to get care, okay? It was 79%, and the spend was 2.2 million when we met them. And I'm not allowed to tell you that they were with a buka, okay? 
So the solutions, eliminate the middles. Anybody know who the middles are? <laughs> I like you. Also, I, I, I've been pretty good. I, cartel hasn't come out of my mouth yet. It normally would have come out in the first minute. Eliminate the middles, get rid of the cartel. And it is a cartel, folks. If you want to spend some time after us talking about it, I'm glad to, if you didn't catch it from that other slide. So we implemented the fair cost plan and went to an independent third-party administrator. Got rid of all the middles. Very important. Active management versus passive management. Let's talk about that very quickly. This is the traditional plan. It's easy. You get off the shelf solutions, everything is there. And so these employers you call on, that's what most of them have. It all comes in one piece. And if you think that, that they're designed to help reduce the employer's cost, I just go look at the stock prices of all those companies we looked at. I think everybody knows this. So that's a passive plan and it's buca insurer built. Okay? What you have to move to is employer built. And this is how it works. You might notice the first building block. Anybody notice that? Direct primary care. So when we met, it was October the 1st. I'll never forget it. I'm sure Lois is regretting it ever since. But we had a meeting at from 1 o'clock in the afternoon to 6 o'clock that night, building the health plan with Dr. Gross's help and many of our partners to do DeSoto Built Healthcare. And we literally picked the best bricks to build the plan. We didn't say off the shelf, they're all customized for them. Okay? And that's employer built healthcare. That's a big difference. We relocalized care and got neighborhood healthcare. The world's a big place. We're going to take you down to where they are, they're in South Central Florida. And what we did is relocalized it and built a community health plan. So the goal is, they're right there in that little blue dot, is to grow and reach the other, com other employers in the community and grow the plan and offer the same types of things they're able to offer their employees to everyone and bring the community together again. Neighbors talking to neighbors, back the way it was. And I'm going to let you all read this. You can read it as well as I can say it. If I try to say that, it'll take me 20 minutes. But it is eliminating the counterproductive barriers that are the barrier to care. My father, I mean, as, as he finished his career, retired January 15, the red tape he had to go through to get anything done with the patients. We've eliminated Lois and her team. And we have a whole different pre-certification list for their hospital, for their members. They were with a buca before we met them, and they were having claims, uh, uh, sur uh, procedures not allowed at their own hospital with their own members because they were getting denied. And they were paying the buca. That's how crazy it is. So that's, that's the most, probably one of the most critical things we'll talk about. And uh, then we utilize a cost and quality transparency tool and offer direct cash pay. We had uh, three babies born at uh, another hospital because they don't have obstetrics. That hospital charges $37,000 for a vaginal birth. My dad about fell out of his chair when I told him that. And they were able to negotiate a cash price for 7,500 bucks. And the member got 50% of that savings up to $2,000 back to offset any cost. That's what this hospital, that's benefits done for you, not to you. But they are able to do it because of the amount of money they saved. So here's what happens in the book of plans. So any of your DPC docs that are talking to employers, I'll bet my right arm, 90% of them, have a BUCA insurance plan. And if they're self-funded, meaning they self-insure, it is probably with a BUCA. And it is insurer-built healthcare, and it does not work. Here's the things. These guys know about some of the costs and quality, but they don't do anything. And that's, I can go over numerous examples. We've, we, we had a, another client about an hour and 10 minutes from Lois had a colonoscopy for $20,000. I don't know about y'all, but I want a part of that. I think they're still on the table. And they better get the money's worth. So anyway, and they're doing it with your money. This is what goes on out there. All right. So we saw the lack of pricing transparency. We have access to CMS databases through one of our partners. They get the cost of procedure, what Medicare pays, what the hospital bills by DRG code. And there's a nurse navigator that helps them through the process. 
and most important is quality. One of the great things of working with Dr. Crouch and Dr. Gross and, and Ann is their office, or as y'all know, they already had a lot of local relationships. So we're able to get their, their local relationships, their local specialists and physicians into the, our quality center, and they were reviewed, and every one of them checked out. So we wanted to get people to the right doctor. We just covered earlier all doctors are not created equal. So it's important that we get them to the right quality. And again, your plan design has to reward good decisions. We'll talk about that in a second. Ten times the benefits for half the cost. Weaponize the plan design. DeSoto also became their own PBM. Pharmacy benefit manager, the, the drug dispenser for the drugs. They were able to become their own PBM. I want to show you how, who's ever seen the pharmaceutical shell game? Anybody? That's the employer. That's the member. Not real complicated. Probably not a lot of money changing hands there, right? That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> Apparently not. All right. You got the manufacturer, Merck and Pfizer as an example, the three drug wholesalers. Are y'all looking here real closely? Those three drug wholesalers in the top 25 and the Fortune 500. They also do hospital supplies and other things, but they're making a lot of money. Hey, that's 10 bucks. You leave it on the table. Nobody laughed at that either. Um, pharmacy benefit manager, those are the three, three chief cartel leaders, CVS, Express Scripts, and Optum. They run the market. By the way, I left out Optum owns 292 companies of those 630 that United owns. And go watch a commercial. Does anyone know what they do? Watch the commercial. I, I can't figure it out. It doesn't say. It's just blue, 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 a lot of stuff. All right. All right. That wasn't supposed to be funny, but. Uh. All right. So then you, got the, then you got the pharmacies up here. And so what DeSoto did is they became their own PBM. So we got rid of the middle person, another middle, the second middle eliminated. And then they tried to focus and work with community pharmacies. So Lois said, said hey, I want our employees all over that you know, have kids that live outside the community. They can't go to a community pharmacist or go to a grocery store pharmacy. They still need to be able to go to the, the cartel members and we'll do a different differential copay. So they still can go, but it'll cost them a little more. So that's how we were able to help steer and direct the members. And then a couple of things real quick. They have two plans. They got a plan that uses Dr. Lee and Dr. Crouch back there, DPC and non-DPC. It was a rich plan of design that eliminated deductibles and coinsurance. Guys, this plan that they have hadn't been done in 30 years. You don't have to have deductibles. The richer the plan, the lower the claims. It's the, I could have done my whole George Costanza deal. Anybody know George Costanza? You remember the episode when he said, I'm going to do the opposite of everything I've ever done my whole life? So he walked up to a, a very attractive woman at the table and said, my name's George, I'm unemployed, I live at home with my parents. And she said, have a seat. <laughs> so, so do the opposite. These brokers are telling these employers to raise their deductible and they're out of pockets. We've become a functionally uninsured nation. People are scared to use their health plan because it's going to cost them a lot of money. So through Lois's foresight and, and Dan and Vance and the whole team, they said, we're not doing a deductible. So what we did is we put in uh, three different options for the, for the members. They can go to their hospital for no deductible and no coinsurance. Real important, we'll come back to that later. If they can't get the services done there, they didn't want to penalize them, look at the deductibles that they go outside to the friends and family hospitals. Those don't exist. Go, IBM, go look at any, they don't have plans like this. They've got higher deductibles than that. And then the non-DeSoto, again, but we also offer that when we get the cash price, we also offer them a way to offset it. I think y'all ought to give Lois a round of applause. All right. Now, I say the best for last. I know Dr. Gross is going, what about us? So we implemented DPC with Epiphany. And this is one of my favorite. This is one of the books y'all saw. I'll let you read it. That's what David Goldhill said, one of those, the catastrophic care book. Probably one of my favorites is this. Thanks for your $1,800 a month premium. We've got your $100 office visits covered. So, so one of the things that I noticed, so I was, right before I went off to college, um, and I actually did graduate, but r right before I went off to college, I remember when I went to see a, a pediatrician, 
that it was a, I remember it was a, August of 1985, Macon, Georgia's hottest fire. It's like central Florida. And I was sweating bullets. And I know that Miss Yancey, who's a little fireball of a woman, nurse practitioner, was going to come out, grab my finger, and prick it with that razor blade back then. He was a hole punch now. Remember, you wear that gauze pad for a couple of hours afterwards? And as I sat in that room that day, how many people were sitting in that waiting room in August of 1985 with me? Anybody? Zero. Why? Because that was a health care visit that my parents paid for. It wasn't an insurance visit. Insurance is for high intensity, I mean, high intensity, low frequency events. Not that. That's what DPC does. That's what all of y'all do in this room. So what DeSoto did is by bringing DPC in, is they were allowed, the aware of, excuse me, they were able to separate health care and insurance so all for health care to their people. And the insurance is for the big surgeries. So they went back to the old days. Health care and insurance were merged in the late 80s and became health insurance. That's where the thing went off the tracks. We also implemented a uh, proprietary uh, claim analytics platform we're going to talk about and implemented integrated coordinated care. And I'm going to speak to that real quick. Um, one of the things that we try to do, uh, some of y'all may not know this, but normally 10% of your patients or employees drive 73% of your cost. That's how a health plan works. And I, I never forget, Dr. Gross will hit me for telling a story, but when, when he was there on October the 1st and Ann was there, we were going through all the data. And there's some people that they, they've got some, you know, unhealthy people like all groups. And I don't think that Dr. Gross had ever seen the data presented that way. I know he's read a lot and seen a lot, but as we saw it, he started treating the patients. He said, Carl, there's, there's some unhealthy people here. I said, yeah, where were you on October the 1st when we talked about it? I just had to do that and have fun with him. So anyway, here's what you got the rest of the group. So we got to find a way to address these people at the top. So when we met Lois, there were 66 people identified with three types of conditions. We called them lifestyle management, anybody with claims 5,000 or less, active disease management, five to 10,000 in claims, and then, then uh, chronic care management, anything over 10,000 in claims. So we were able to stratify the risk. After three months on this data analytics platform, remember it was a BUCA analytic platform. Three months, people had to have a claim, 31 more people were identified in three months for these programs. Does that tell you all anything? All right, and here's what we did. Here's about the people they identified. This chronic care management, I'm going to let Lois talk about it, but there were some unbelievable stories on Monday and Tuesday from the employees. This is a service where if you're a diabetic, the hospital invested in this program. They give their diabetics a glucometer, all free diabetic supplies, all of that. What does that do? It cuts out ER admits, inpatient admits, person's a lot healthier and better. Remember, benefits for you, not to you. And then Dr. Gross and Dr. Krauts get a readout every week of these. Now, the things we heard is, how's this program working? They're bugging the heck out of me. They call me all the time. So if somebody did their glucometer test, they're calling asking ask them why they hadn't done it. Blood pressure, heart monitor, whatever. I'll let them get into it, but we call it integrated coordinated care. Almost done. All right, and then we looked at, at uh, the opioid utilization. We have a way to get granular. And like every employer in America, you're kidding yourself if you don't think these issues exist all over the place. Dr. Gross and Dr. Krauss solved some serious conditions they may speak to about that. And then we drill down granular. And I'm just giving you an idea of what data analytics can do for you. All right, results. Anybody want to see the results? We lost a million dollars. I'm done. Okay. Um, <laughs> We relocalize care. Um, when you do self-funded insurance, you buy stop-loss coverage, so the employer absorbs a risk up to, say, 75000 for each member, and then you have an insurance policy on it. If you're with a BUCA, they do the same thing. If you're fully insured, they do the same thing behind the scenes. They save 58% on their stop-loss premiums, $150,000, because of the programs that are in place here through this health plan. They offer 10 times the benefits for half the cost. You're going to see that in a minute. This is probably one of the biggest things. They reduced the foreign medical spend from 79% to 62%. 
They had people in the hospital who hadn't had care in there, what, Lois, 20-year uh, uh, employment there, had never gone to the hospital because the old plan had the same deductible. So people would go wherever, and maybe they don't want Dr. Estes to see them naked. I don't know. But, I mean, there's always that element in a, in a smaller community. That was, that was supposed to be funny, but whatever. That wasn't funny. So that's a big one. They hired the first full-time surgeon in the history of the county. This is groundbreaking stuff, guys. How come y'all aren't up yep, yelling, ready to walk through a wall? It's the big stuff. And they had the second ever rate decrease in the history of the stop-loss carrier's existence. A rate decrease. And here's, what, here's the results. That's how much money they saved. Give Lois a round of applause. And, and Dr. Gross and Dr. Crouch part of y'all's whole contingency. That's how we did it. The direct primary care was significant part of this. So the next steps are this. This was three months, and I want to point this out. Those first three months were on a BUCA plan. The next seven months were on this fair cost plan that Lois and them helped do. Look how much was spent. Two and a half times as many months, barely any more money spent. That book is, uh, took a hit, uh, stock price took a hit because of this. I'm kidding. All right. And so that's what it looks like. Now, one year, y'all just saw the numbers. They were under a million in claims. One year. That's, that's world changing, folks. That helps fix some of the rural challenges that we face. All right. And then the impact on the renewal. We just finished the first year. Ten times the benefits. Y'all saw the rate decrease. We've already seen that. So in the words of the Doobie Brothers, taking it to the streets, that was supposed to be funny, but I'd lose again, didn't I? Dr. Shears, you could at least laugh. All right, city, county, and school, we're talking to the city, the county, and the school now about bringing them in the fold. And as you know from governmental things, sometimes it takes time, but we actually have some interest, and that's what they're trying to do is keep the care local. Bring it together, make it a neighborhood. And then medium and large employers. And we're trying to get a forum together to have that. Um, very quickly, and these are two things I want. Any DPC doc, if you write anything down today, please write this down. These are the two most important benchmarks for a health plan. And I will tell you right now, I've never met an employer that could tell me what the answers were ever. Okay? At Lois and her and her and the hospitals was, was at about near 14,000 per employee per year. They're 6,300 now. And the drug expense per member per month was about 1, 126, and it's about 66. So that's the numbers that matter. And there are a lot of people out there doing it. Jonathan, George, all of us are doing it. This stuff is possible. We've got other clients. There's uh, there was a video crew. Uh, at the hospital, that's, this is going to be uh, pre presented to HHS and the White House administration of what these folks have done. Dr. Gross was interviewed. Um, all of this stuff is real and it's repeatable. So if you've got a rural hospital in your community, let's talk. You can fix it. It is possible. And all it takes is a good advisor, DPC, and a little courage. Um, so Uber your health plan before it gets Kodak. Um, and I don't know if I have anything else. But I want to, the leadership at the hospital, Lois, uh, Dan, and Vince was significant in all this. And with their support, this was all possible. And I think the stories she'll talk to you about were quite remarkable in what we heard from the employees when we were doing our benefit education meetings. That's, I think that's all I had. Thank you. My name is Lois Hilton. I am the HR director at DeSoto Memorial Hospital. As Carl said, we are 49 bed rural hospital um, in central uh, West Florida and uh, we are a, an independent facility. We are a governmental nonprofit independent facility so every single penny counts to us and we also are um, very engaged with our employees in our community and so one of the things from an HR perspective that the cost of health care kept going up and up and up to us as an employer 
and we were concerned about how are we going to um, be able to keep affording great coverage for the employees and their dependents. Um, and at the same time, you know, we are a hospital, so looking out, you know, what can we do, you know, big picture. Um, so we had had an opportunity to meet Dr. Uh, Gross and his group uh, through some direct contracting with some other um, and, uh, uh, surgeries and things like that. And then Carl brought him um, on board and talked to us about direct primary care and incorporating that into our group health plan. And I will tell you that from an HR perspective, he is very true. You know, what he said was true. We do not like to change plans for the sake of changing plans because it is painful. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of uh, back in the back room work. It's a lot of engagement with the employees, educating them on their plan. And you know, if and I will tell you the truth, if we're only going to save ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, it's not worth it almost because it's so painful to change plans. But I will tell you that uh, Carl and with Dr. Gross and you know, it took a year. Going to be honest with you, it took a year to get us. Uh, me slower than the, our CEO was ready from day one, but our CFO and I were like, uh, you know, uh, kind of a little bit slower to the gate. But um, I, I will tell you, this has been the most rewarding year for me. Uh, we became, um, we, we created this plan January 1st with Carl's help and Dr. Gross's help. And yes, Dr. Gross was there at that meeting, sitting at the boardroom with us um, and that type of thing. And um, it, it was a phenomenal opportunity. And so January 1st, we got it started. Um, I, I will tell you the one thing that was exciting was that we just renewed for our next, or did our plan for this next, and open enrollment for this next January 1st year. This is the first time in 30 years that we did not have to sit around the boardroom table trying to figure out we had a 25% increase in our, in our reinsurance and costs and all of that. You know, how are we going to absorb this as a hospital that we struggle to make a positive bottom line every year? And how much are we going to pass on to the employees that can't afford any more money coming out of their pockets? So I will tell you, it was rewarding this year not to have to do that. Um, we were able to keep everything the same and keep the um, benefits very rich for our employees. So um, it has been a win-win, and I have been very excited this past year um, to be a part of incorporating direct primary care into our health plan for our employees and see how that works um, with our employees. Um, I will tell you that direct primary health care, you know, health care employees, um, if you talk to a lot of insurance people or people that are in the business, they will tell you, and you guys probably know you're health care people, geez. Um, health care employees are probably some of the sickest employees out there. They do not take care of themselves. They know better, but they do the opposite, and they self-diagnose in the whole nine yards. Um, so, uh, you know, we we had some pretty sick people. Have some, we used to have some pretty sick people. They're getting better, um, it, you know, in our plan. And the the one thing that um, really sold a lot of people was in the direct primary health care since. There is no insurance billing. You don't have to worry about doing the collecting and all of that. You guys have these extended um, time frames for visits to where you have a meaningful, engaged meeting with your physician. I can remember the first time I met with um, one of the docs at Epiphany, and I won't say which one, um, but we were you know, having our first meeting, getting to know each other and everything, and then we're sitting here and goes, okay, anything else? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I had never had a doctor's visit where I literally sat there and had time to talk and he listened and asked more questions. No names. <laughs> but it was phenomenal. And I will tell you, in healthcare, we have some of the most critical employees. Um, they are very critical of their physicians, providers, everybody else. And so, when we were doing open enrollment for the first time last year, I saw some of our most 
challenging employees um, had chosen direct primary care. And I'm like, oof, this will be interesting. So um, I, uh, after I waited about a quarter and I saw those employees and I said, hey, I said, by the way, I said, you know, it's been more than 60 days because that was a requirement that you had to meet your primary care and get to know them. And I said, how's it going? I said, how did you like it? They raved about it. And I had to have my poker face on because I knew it, you know, I knew that was going to happen. But it, it was phenomenal. So, you know, when you can sell a health team of healthcare providers on direct primary care and that concept of managing their care and listening to them because it, it, it's huge. It's huge. So it's been very rewarding. Um, part of the process is, as, as Carl had mentioned, as including the direct primary health care, we also gave employees the option of keeping their current um, primary care physicians that they had. So we, we made an in, a, a combo kind of plan, and we, we have different deductibles. They do pay a little bit more money to keep their other um, primary cares. Uh, but beyond that, the plan's the same. The plan's identical. So um, that was very uh, comforting to the employees to know that regardless of whether they did direct primary care and or uh, not, um, the plan was the same. And so that kind of sold the program a little bit better as well. And the employees, we did ask them also, we do a wellness program that goes with it, and uh, Dr. Gross and Dr. Crouch are part of that. Um, they also get the data from that. And we do... We built the program to, with the direct primary care, thinking about wellness, thinking about people getting engaged and more active in their health care. Because I will tell you, I know what our employees did. I used to do it. We used to hand them their insurance card that had the Buca name on it, <laughs> the other c company's name on it. And we had plan design. We've been, we've been self-funded for probably 30 years. But we had plan designs. It might as well have been an insurance plan, a straight plan. And um, so, you know, the, the, the employees went, oh, well, my copay is going to be X or my deductible is X. doesn't matter where I go as long as I stay in that huge network. Well, as you guys know, and what was bringing it to light is when Dr. Uh, Gross was bringing our him or bringing us as a hospital some of his clients to do cash deals for knee surgeries because they didn't have insurance and all of that. It was like, wow, okay, we need to kind of start driving this a little bit better. And then the prices. I mean, I'm in healthcare. I knew the prices were different, but didn't pay attention. So Carl had to knock me over the head and go, "What are you doing?" <laughs> kind of thing. So you know, in looking at the comparison, because. A knee surgery, for example, the examples we gave was the knee surgery, and you guys know these as docs. You can go from $20,000 at one facility all the way up to $60,000 at another for the same procedure. And the employees didn't care where they went because it was the same amount of money out of their pocket. Same copay, same deductible. But I will tell you, as a self funded plan, we pay the difference. And so the light bulb finally went off, and getting the employees actively engaged in understanding all of that um, has been, I will tell you, it has been a lot of work this year. Um, and, you know, employees that were just used to being given their card going, you could go wherever, um, now we're trying to direct them to the direct primary care, uh, trying to direct them into a more narrow network that we have negotiated prices with, um, and focused on their care and in their wellness. And it has been a very rewarding and successful year um, in all of that. So uh, the employees, too, the, the light bulbs are going off. And we just had open enrollment, Carl, and well, Dr. Gross is there Monday as well. And, and I am going to stand up here and be truthfully honest with you, and I expected it to be a gripe session. I truly did, because we made some huge changes last January. I was pleasantly surprised and very happy to say that that did not happen. Our employees are now engaged, they understand, and they understand that if they're saving money, we're saving money as an employer, and that we then are going to be able to keep their benefits rich, you know, and, and use dollars for other things. And because, for example, the money that we saved on our plan to our hospital being a rural facility, that can make the difference between us being a negative net 
for the year or a positive. It truly can make the difference to us. And so with that savings, um, you know, we're very, very thankful. We're thankful DPC is here. And have I forgotten anything, Carl? No, I, I did want to, am I mic'd up? Uh, I did want to say one quick thing. When y'all saw the choices they had, their employees can go to the Mayo, the Cleveland Clinic, they go wherever they want. That doesn't exist in America. There's no barriers. They want them to get the care they need. There might be a little bit higher price tag, as y'all saw, but that's significant. I forgot that. Choices yep. to go anywhere. Yep, they can. And, and we asked them, and, and, and we engaged a company to be, and, and Carl mentioned it, we engaged a company to help navigate us to providers. Um, I had an employee a couple years ago come to me and say, my husband needs to have back surgery. And you, everybody knows that people in healthcare are very skeptical about everybody. And even if their doctor says, go to Dr. A, you're like, mm, I don't know if I want Dr. A or not. So an employee came to me and said, hey, you know, can you help me with this? I went to my CFO. We contacted our other it was before Carl. We contacted our other um, broker and all of that and um, actually got zero help. They said they could not help us because we were looking for, you know, people in the region that had done that kind of procedure. How many have they done? What was their infection control rate? Um, you know, the whole nine yards and we could get no help. Well, now we have engaged a company to help our employees navigate and find those folks. And um, they vet these uh, physicians and hospitals and surgery centers and all of that for stuff that we can't do. And it's a win-win. Um, Thank you. All right, if I could get my slides up here, I'm going to skip past a lot of them and sort of jump right to some, some results here. So I, I want to point out a couple, a couple things here. So you've heard from the, the plan designer perspective. You've, you've heard from human resources, the employer's perspective. Uh, I just want to, to make one point real perfectly clear, if it wasn't real clear. This plan went from a self-funded plan to a self-funded plan and saved $1.2 million. They did not go from a fully insured plan to a self-funded plan and save $1.2 million. So they just redesigned the plan. I'm going to tell you from, a, from the DPC perspective, um, I do not have a contract with Carl. I am not officially integrated into the health plan. I have a contract, and our practice has a contract directly with the hospital. Uh, and so our practice is directly engaged with the hospital. We have to sell every employee on it. They have to choose us. Um, so it is not the hospital choosing the doctor for the employee. It's not the, 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 the plan being designed and given to the employee. The employee has a choice. Pick your doctor, stay with your doctor, stick with your primary, do everything you've ever done, or go with, go with this other group, the, DP, the DPC, and they design the options in, in there for the patient. So uh, again, our contract is specifically with the employer. I'm going to blow past all this stuff because I just want to get right to the meat of this. Uh, I got a nice picture of Dr. George here because I was going to tell a great story about a patient that we had come into the United States for affordable medical care, uh, a patient of hers that she diagnosed with thyroid cancer. We co-managed with the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. They quoted over $100,000 to have her thyroid cancer surgery in San Juan. We did it for $10,000 here in the United States. Uh, and so now we're able to do these sort of procedures here actually in, in DeSoto Memorial Hospital. And so a knee replacement standard uh, in most places, forty-five dollars to $60,000. If you want to fly to Singapore, you can get that done for eighteen dollars to $22,000. Or you can go to DeSoto Memorial Hospital, a four-star CMS hospital, and get it done for $18,550. So essentially what we've done through our practice, since we now see uninsured patients from all over the state of Florida, they come to us and we help work with them through DeSoto Hospital. And we now have the first hospital in the country that provides transparent bundled cash pricing on an inpatient basis for surgeries. So DeSoto Memorial Hospital right here. And when you see the cost of medical care now for the employers, a family of four PPO is over 20, 20, almost $28,000. The employee is out of pocket now, $11,000. Everyone is a self-pay patient at this point. If we look at our membership fees, we've been flat for a decade. We've seen zero cost inflation whatsoever in our practice. Uh, and so when you're an individual and you're having to choose between a twenty uh, $8,000 PPO plan uh, that has a seventy, almost $8,000 deductible or a 
$2,000 DPC plan that basically get, provides everything that you need done, that swing of $26,000 per year is actually a really big deal to the average family. And so the question is, can we then translate that to a self-funded health plan? Can we translate that same savings to the employer? Because if an individual or a family of four were to just get a direct primary care membership, plus some major medical catastrophic high deductible, you know, just like your homeowner's insurance, you hope you never need it, and if, you, and if the house is on fire, you've got it. Why can't we build the health plan where you have that high deductible major medical plan, and over the course of 10 years, a family of four would save about a quarter of a million dollars if they were to use their insurance properly and use, do a DPC. So again, the question is, can you translate that to an employer? And so that's exactly what we did through DeSoto Memorial Hospital. Uh, and I'm gonna, this is our original, pictures from our original employee benefits presentation. Uh, we all kind of showed up and did a, what about 12 <laughs> or 14 employee presentations through the year, course right? of the, that was last year. Yeah. Uh, and so one thing I want to point out is that that top graph on the left-hand side, I know these are, aren't are great pictures, but what you're going to see is that the, D, study, the, the top is the DPC yeah. portion, the bottom where Carl's hand is pointing to is the non-DPC option. And what I'll tell you is that the health plan is designed to steer the patients towards, towards making the choices they want them to make. They're giving them the tools to make the right choice and they're financially incentivizing. So if the employee chose to sign up for DPC, the hospital actually lowered their premiums by 20%. Okay. So no copays, no deductibles, nothing for their out-of-pocket expenses for all the routine care in our practice, and they're gonna lower their premiums by 20% if they choose us. Can I say one thing on that? Go for it. You? it. That's important because when we talked about finding an advisor, and not a broker. Uh, there are many examples around the country because I was asking questions. Dr. Gross knows this. If you don't weaponize the plan correctly, then you won't get the utilization. And the hospital had the foresight to do that. And you should charge less for that plan because they're going to get better care and they're going to lower the cost over time. So I want to make sure we have plenty of time for Sean to share, to share his experience, but I'm going to tell you that as the DPC doctor, since we designed this plan, and I, we were part of the plan design, we sat with the leadership team to build the plan, we submitted a list of all of the, the people that we wanted to use. We submitted a list of the imaging centers we used. We submitted a list of the specialists we refer to, and they checked off everybody on the list, and if we send somebody to somebody on our list, we don't have to get any authorizations, we don't have to get any approvals, and they give us total control over how to manage the patients in that plan. So much to our surprise, 60% of the hospital employees signed up for us on day number one. <laughs> Um, but what you'll see, so the advantage of us is we have a built-in control group. So we have the DPC group and a non-DPC group in our year, and we can actually compare how these two groups uh, played out. And what, I'll sh what we've noticed is that we tended to get a lot more individuals. So actually the families with the kids, not entirely surprising, but the family with the kids tended to stick with their, their pediatricians. Uh, we see ages five and up, and so they, they had some splits, but 2.7 members uh, per family in the non-DPC, 1.7 in the DPC group. Uh, but look at the chronic conditions. We had 35% more chronic conditions in the DPC population, so we definitely selected for a sicker group. So 846 per thousand uh, uh, versus 623 uh, per, per thousand. That's going to become important because I know a lot of you guys don't like to collect data, the nasty D word. Uh, we don't like to code, you don't like to do anything. We went round and round about this. Uh, I lost the turkey <laughs> dinner to Carl. Uh, so this is our, our one year claims data. And I want you to look at that first line and say the DPC total claims per member per month, $114 on the DPC side and $99 on the non-DP side. We spent more money on the DPC side. Wait a second, I thought we were saving these people money. Um, well, first of all, I want to point on that very right-hand column. That is the national benchmark for the same services. So both the DPC and non-DPC side came well under the $450 uh, national landmarks for those same exact services. But the DPC was more expensive. But once you started adjusting for the chronic conditions and the illness that was actually in the DPC group, all of a sudden, uh, you started to see about a 30 percent, 37, almost a 40 percent reduction in cost of management of the chronic conditions through the DPC side of the practice. Uh, on the pharmacy claims, again, 
pharmacy claims were higher in the DPC patients. If we're not collecting any of this data, we look like we're more expensive, but because we were tracking this information, tracking chronic diseases, we knew what was happening in this population, we were able to see and then adjust for this and say, of course we spent more money because our patients were much sicker and we actually had the, the claim uh, and, the, and the data proof that, that that was in fact happening. And when you adjust it again, we're seeing about 36 to 37% reduction in all uh, claims for the DPC side uh, as you're managing these chronic conditions. So a, a, a huge savings in total, in total claims. Uh, so this is actually more the, the raw data, and this is kind of getting to where, where uh, Carl was saying, on that domestic spend. On the DPC side, out of the 114 total dollars per member per month that we spent, $73 of that was spent actually at the hospital itself. Okay. So just to, just to restate that, 64% of every dollar that was spent went from the hospital's right pocket to the hospital's left pocket. Okay? If that wasn't clear. Uh, on the other side, on the non-DP side, it was 38%. So we were driving all of the volume basically into the hospital for routine care. That's another reason our numbers look better. You know it's more expensive to get care in the hospital, but those dollars didn't really change hands. It's a paper transaction. Uh, so while we looked really expensive, uh, since all that money was spent from the hospital to the hospital, that, those were not actually real cash transactions. Uh, we reduced uh, our ER uh, claims by 31%, and look at the specialty claims. 83 specialty claims on the direct primary care side versus 207 on the non-DPC side. We had a 60% reduction in specialty consultations in our practice. Goofy doctors, and I didn't even know who he was, and she was close And then that last, that? that bottom line here is we had a 30% reduction in total out-of-pocket expenses at the at the point of, of transaction from the, the employee. So co-pays, deductibles, specialty consults, everything across the board, 30% reduction. So. 20% reduction in premiums plus a 30% reduction in all out-of-pocket expenses, uh, eliminating co-pays, eliminating deductibles. And so when we sat down with the stop-loss carrier in that room to design the plan, the stop-loss carrier looked us in the face and she said, the DPC is the glue that holds this plan together. Uh, and that is the reason, because they know you have a management plan to take care of these patients with chronic conditions, so you're not going to get those big hits. We built that into the, into the plan, and so they immediately came in and gave a reduction, and as Carl said, for the second time in this company's history, they re reduced premiums in year number two uh, because of, you know, collectively the, the plan design and the work that we're doing. Again, reduced premiums 20%, eliminated co-pays, deductibles, there's no barriers to access. And so what Carl was saying is we designed the plan to weaponize it, to have the patients make good choices. Um, we didn't do so by raising obstacles to care. We didn't do so by, by increasing deductibles. We didn't do so by putting step edits. It was done through eliminating copays, eliminating deductibles, lowering out-of-pocket cost to care, eliminating barriers, eliminating network restrictions, eliminating uh, uh, challenges to the doctors, and letting the physicians manage the patients. So I'm going to try to focus a little more about the, the nuts and bolts of how we get people into our practice. Uh, mine's a little, our store is pretty similar, but we have a lot more patients to get on board. So, you know, how, how, if you get, if you land a, a bigger employer, you know, how, how do you, how do you get those patients onboarded? Uh, this is uh, me and my uh, 50, 50 partner, Dr. Amy. Uh, she's the good looking one there. This, I have this slide on there to remind me if you guys can get glamour shots done, go ahead and get those done. <laughs> They will work for a lot of people. Um, for most people, uh, <laughs> Billy's out there. They do not work for you, Billy. So I don't, I don't know if he's here somewhere. <laughs> so we're in Anderson, South Carolina. So <clears throat> we are in a small suburban area about uh, right in between Atlanta and Charlotte on I-85. So right in the middle, about 200,000 people in our, in our community. Um, we've been open for about four years. And one theme that we heard over and over t today so far is this takes time, so you need to have patience when you're working with employers. They don't, the ship doesn't turn around overnight. Um, so you need to have patience. And Carl listed a bunch of, th of ways to find employers. One is look at your current patients right now. So a lot of your current patients right now work for somebody, and that's where you need to start looking for uh, your connection to employers. So we've been open for about four years. Three of those years, we spent time connecting with our, our county employees. 
Uh, we had some county employees that were already seeing us. They loved our services. It took some time, uh, but we were able to get the right people in the room and make some meetings. And it still took another two years for them to decide that they wanted to go away from a BUCA plan, which they had been on for 20 plus years. So they were used to paying that, and they were on a full PPO plan, Carl. So not self-funded. I know, and fully so insured. Fully insured PPO plan, paying a check every month, and just uh, renewing every year, 10% hikes every year. That's good money. Uh, so uh, it took us about three years to, to get in there and make some changes. And this is what happened overnight for us. Uh, we went from adding about 800 patients overnight. So um, I'm going to show you the numbers later as we, as we get down to see how many exactly they had. So the question I have is, are you ready for something like this to happen to you? Um, are you ready? For, do you have the, the means to do that? Do you have the, the uh, uh, employees to do it? Do you need a staffing? Uh, ramp up your staffing. Do you have the physicians to do that? How are you going to get all those people in there? Uh, this is a, a big, big issue you need to consider. Um, so Anderson County is about 200,000 uh, people, a pretty, fairly large uh, area size. So we had actually another DPC physician just over the county line who was able to, to do some of the same services we were able to offer. So it's about a 20, 25 mile distance. So we're able to cover the whole county, which made it a little bit easier. Um, they have almost uh, 1,000 employees, 2,000 covered lives, and they had about 1,000 people sign up for the DPC plan. Um, that included four, four of our, our DPC physicians, another DPC, DPC physician in uh, the community next to us, and a DPC pediatrician, Dr. Hill, who's here with us today. Um, included in all those uh, numbers. <clears throat> so where is Anderson, South Carolina? Most of you probably don't know. We're in Orlando, so there's a picture of where we are, the northwest corner uh, near, this is a cuss word for Carl, near Clemson University. <clears throat> so. I hate orange. So their, our health plan, what they scheduled for the, it, it, it went very similar to what Carl has, has talked about already. They were on a, a BUCA plan for 20 plus years. They decided they want to make a change. They were try, tired of getting hit for the 10 or 15% markups every year. Uh, they did a lot of research, looked at other communities and tried to come up with a decision. And they transitioned over to a self-funded plan. Um, their plan was originally crafted uh, by David Contorno, who was also a Health Rosetta colleague of, of Carl's, um, for a local broker. Uh, so they were really DPC focused as well. Um, they really liked what we were doing at DPC. We spent a lot of hours with them explaining how we operate and how our practice was um, developed and our mission. And so they really loved, loved that. They wanted to keep everything local. They wanted to use local brokers, local physicians, sort of the same kind of plan that you guys worked on. Um, they also offered, we also offered two, two options. The standard plan, because they, they did not want to pull people away from their physician. Who, if you had a doctor for 20 years, you want to keep your doctor. So they did offer the same standard plan and a DPC plan. And much like Carl, uh, Carl and Dr. Gross's plan, they really pushed people to the DPC plan. We're going to talk about how they did that. Um, so they, they crafted it to drive people towards the DPC the same way Carl had mentioned. So benefits uh, from the employees, they basically, they didn't pay any monthly fees or us. All, all that was in, in their plan already. So when you paid their premium, that included their DPC fee. They didn't pay anything extra. All labs and in-house generic medications were covered. So if they came into our clinic and we did a thyroid panel, any kind of lab panel, all that was included, paid by the uh, the county because they were getting that for 80% cheaper than they can get it anywhere else. We have a pretty extensive generic pharmacy in, in house, and we did uh, any medication we could do in house, we would give the patients and they would cover those costs, and it would basically zero cost to the patient. All in house testing procedures, anything we do in our clinic cost them nothing. There were no copays for visits, obviously. Um, they had all the access. Uh, that we usually provide with a DPC clinic. And they had no out-of-pocket costs for imaging. So if we saw someone that had uh, 
bad shoulder, they hurt themselves, we were, you know, therapy didn't work, we want to get an MRI, we would refer them for MRI, and it would cost them zero out of pocket to get that MRI. So for us, there were no prioritizations, and Carl mentioned that before, we, no prioritizations, no step therapy, so if you wanted to put somebody on a PPI, you didn't have to go through an H2 blocker or something like that, no step therapy, uh, no, no coding for us, there was uh, no hidden coding, no hidden data. <clears throat> um, so uh, they never, we talked to them for years, and they never once mentioned, hey, we want these codes, we want these claims, we want this data. Um, so hopefully they're going to get some, get the claims that they need later. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there was no, they use a medical management program, but we weren't involved in that. Um, so any, like a specialist, they had to get everything set through this medical management program. If any kind of tests or procedures had to be done, we didn't have to, to deal with that. And we were able to, uh, like Lee said, we were able to really just take care of patients, focus on them, and provide the quality care to uh, improve their health. Um, so some pitfalls. The other big issue we've heard today, it's sort of the undertone, is education, education, education. Um, if, you've, if they've been on a, a fully funded PPO plan for 20 years and you switch them to a, a uh, self-funded plan with a, a funny looking card that nobody in their community knows what that card means, they're going to get denied care everywhere they go. You're going to go in there to a specialist, you're going to refer them, and the cardiologist is going to say, we don't take that insurance everywhere they go. So there has to be a massive amount of education and we, um, it wasn't our job, the insurance and the county needed to spend a lot more time educating the community. And that's continuing to go on. Um, also, the local health system, but the employees, they need to understand it better. Because when they go to a cardiologist and they don't see them, guess who they call? Their primary care physician. I can't get seen. Why? Why can't I get seen? They don't call Carl, the insurance guy. They don't call... Lois, the HR guy, lady, they call me wanting to know why they can't get seen. Their insurance is no good. So education, 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 and, and even for the providers, we have to get a ton of education about how their plan works. Um, so that's something to think about. How many people are doing working with small employers right now doing DPC? Small, when I say small, I mean less than 50 employees. So you maybe have 10 or 20. How many are larger employees say more than a hundred where they have an insurance plan. So if you so when you when you work with a what I would call a large employer where they they actually have an insurance plan that maybe DPC is part of, you're basically you're having to deal with that insurance, right? Because you gotta know what medicines they can deal with, where they can be referred, all that stuff. So you need education as well about how the plan works because they're gonna be calling you about where can I go? What can I do? So education is super helpful. Fees and fund transactions, highly recommend, and I think Lee would agree with this, ACH, ACH, ACH. Um, they, you need to, the employers need to know what your fees are, have those set up front, explain to that. Um, as Lee said, we have a direct contract with the county. We don't go through the broker. You should deal with the employer directly. Tell them what your fees are, have them sign an agreement, um, and so you know, and they know exactly how the money comes out every month. We send them a bill on the first of the month, and the tenth of the month, it drafts out ACH from their account straight into our account. Um, that's the cheapest, fastest way to get that done. Uh, but talk, have that discussion up front. Um, legal issues. Um, Phil Eskew's been here today. I think Luann Leeds is here tomorrow. Uh, these are some pioneer leaders that know about DPC contracting. Um, definitely need to have this legal issues worked out. Well, don't wait till December 31st to get that contract to the employer and get them to sign it. There's going to be some legal hashing out that you have to do. The employers, lawyers are going to want to see that contract, that agreement, to make sure everything's right and tight before you move forward. So think about that up front. Um, Patients dismiss, dismissals. So DPC is not for everyone. Some people are going to not like their physician that they've been assigned to. Um, there's going to be 
mean employees. They're going to be people that are mad for whatever reason. It's just not going to work out. You got to have a way to figure out how to get, get those folks to a new physician. Uh, how do you dismiss patients? So you need to have that conversation with the employer up front. You know, what happens if we have to terminate a relationship? How do you, how do you go about doing that? Along those same lines, we have four providers. So it's, it's come up multiple times. Well, I don't like Dr. So-and-so. I want to switch to this doctor. And then they want to switch to another doctor. And you need to have a plan about switching. Are you going to let people just bounce from place to place and how to go about doing that? Um, addiction issues. Opioid abuse is a huge problem right now. If you sign up 800 employees, you're going to get some with this issue going on. So you need to decide how you're going to handle that as a, as a practice. Are you just going to continue those medications? You're going to refer those out, work with the employer about can you refer those in some form or fashion? Um, you know, is there you know addiction clinic? Or is that something you can do in your clinic? How you want to handle that? You need to have that conversation. Mental health is another big one in our community because we don't have really great access to mental health. So you know, coming up with a good plan on mental health is another big one. So onboarding, onboarding is a huge issue. Um, so get your staff prepared. Maybe you need to limit vacations for the first couple of months. Nobody takes vacation. Maybe you're gonna have to work through lunch a couple of times. Uh, maybe you work extended hours. Try to figure out how you're gonna onboard all these patients. Get your staff prepared to be thinking about that ahead of time. Um, maybe you need to hire some staff. Um, get all the patients registered as soon as possible. When open enrollment is done, they should be sending you as soon as they can an Excel file so you have everybody's name. You know, okay, you're getting 800 patients. So you need those uh, patients to get registered. We use little postcards at open enrollment, had exactly how the people go on our system and how they register in our computer system. And it was step by step. And even when they signed up, the, the folks they were working with would just go over that card with them and get them registered into our system immediately. Um, be in constant communication, be email or texting. We were constantly doing that. Um, we went ahead and registered. Once we got everybody in the system, we pre-assigned everybody a physician. We did give them the option of picking male or female, uh, what we had available. Tried to, tried to accommodate as many people as we can. If they had an old physician, like one of our doctors they, they had seen 10 years ago, we tried to put them back with that same physician. Um, constantly emailing them, hey, you got to sign up, kind of get signed up. Um, so set new patient appointments. So we, once we got everybody in the system, we went ahead and assigned everybody an appointment. And it went out through April with 800 people. So you might have had an appointment on April the, the 2nd for your initial visit. And then we told everybody, <clears throat> you can come on in if you're sick, if you need refills, come in. We'll see you anytime you can. So if somebody got sick on January the 13th, their appointment went until February the 23rd, we just had them come in for a a visit anyway and just took care of them. Um, anybody who did not sign up for us, who didn't register, who for whatever they fell through the crack, we had their name, they knew, we knew they were DPC patients. They did not go and sign up in the system. We built skeleton charts. We took their name, their birthday that we had and built a skeleton chart for them. And then we just pester them to death. Hey, where are you at? We just constantly emailing them, texting them, we're, we need you to come in. Um, so continue to contact those patients. So here's where we are through uh, October. Uh, our fis the fiscal year for our, our uh, plan doesn't end until the end of this year. So these are just some generic en engagement numbers we are through October. So almost 3,000 appointments. Um, this is through four different providers. Uh, so you can read those numbers there, about almost 19,000 text messages. Uh, not a whole lot after hours either. Uh, tons of emails, lots of labs done in office. And to, this is actually probably eight months into it. They were, they're showing about 17% down. So we don't have these, any final much. numbers. Hopefully we'll have stuff by February. But we're seeing a ton of visits, a ton of patients uh, for the county. So let's do some questions. So just like before, we have two microphones. Feel free to queue up. I'll keep mine very quick. That was great, a lot of information there. I just wanted to let everyone know there was one piece of information that Carl 
and Shane omitted, and that's that it's been uh, 14,197 days since the uh, Georgia Bulldogs won a national championship in football. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. He must be a gator. <laughs> Go ahead, over here, over here, microphone. I just want to talk to the, the doctors there about, um, I agree that we have to have employers involved at some level to make direct primary care work, but I'm a little bit more of a purist, and uh, I still see an employer as a third party. Uh, I enjoy the interaction that it's myself and my patient in the room, and the money's coming directly from their pocket to mine. If I provide value to them, they keep coming back. Uh, now there's a third person involved, it's an employer. Uh, to me, it's a slippery slope that we don't want to head down as direct primary care in general, so if you all would just speak to that. Sure, I mean, from my perspective, you know, it, this is not for everyone. I personally would not take on a, a thousand employee group. Um, did I feel comfortable taking on uh, a couple hundred? Yeah, absolutely, that was just my, my personal risk practice tolerance. Uh, again, it's, 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 that's not for everyone. Um, you know, we did specifically structure it in such a way where, you know, again, we made sure that the patients had to pick us, uh, and we made sure that the patients could drop us and cancel us. So although it's, it's not um, ideal and it's certainly not a purist relationship, it works for me. And if, and if it works for me, I'm, frankly, I'm the one that matters in this relationship in my practice. So uh, uh, it, may not work, it may not work for everybody. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Shane. No, I, I, I think... As Lee said, it, it, every practice is different, so you got to decide how you, if you want to manage or to working with employers, you know, in a utopian world, it'd be great if employers were out of the right. picture. I mean, I can tell you that when we interact with small employers, 15 employees, and again, the employee is the one signing up and dropping and signing up and dropping, that, and, and Ann's the one that does the bulk of that work, but I'm going to tell you, that's a lot more work. Uh, because the employees come and go and come and go and come and go, and you've got a pool service business that they're, they're short-term labor, and they leave, and they come, and that, frankly, is a lot more active management in terms of the, the onboarding and offloading process than the annual enrollment that we have to do. Over here. Yeah, I just had mostly a bookkeeping question about the total savings. So for the hospital, was the 54% dependent on them delivering their care to themselves? The comment was made kind of that it went from the left pocket to the right pocket. Was the savings that high because the savings at the hospital wasn't counted against that total? So I'm gonna let Carl get into that a little bit but because I think it's a combination of things. It's a combination of the plan design and it's also a combination of, of maybe, how the employees were accessing care. And maybe the clarification is if this was a school or a non-healthcare entity, would that number have been the same if they had all of the exact same health things happen? Yeah. So the, the claims were the claims. I mean, th this was actually care that was provided. Uh, so the, the numbers would be the same whether it was a school or whether whether it was you know the county or the or the prison. Th th those claims are were actual healthcare services that were were acquired by the patient and billed to the plan. The behind the scenes of what that fiscal impact is on the hospital was not reflected in the slides here, but it was probably more significant than the 1.2 million dollar savings actually seen. So I think the 1.2 million is a low number. A and one thing that I would point out is that. The accountable care organizations, okay, these are the crazy CMS contraptions that, are, that were put in place to put the physicians personally financially on the hook for, for patient management. The first five years, the accountable care organizations lost money. Uh, we're now year number six, and CMS just announced that they saved $750 million, almost $1 billion, billion dollars, um, last year in accountable care organizations through all these crazy reporting systems. Well, that's 11 million beneficiaries, and so the per member per year savings was about $63. And what is your calculation that we save per member? About 7,600. About $7,600. Okay. So, 100 times that in, in, in the first year alone. Yeah. Yes, over here. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I believe that corporate America is the way to be able to. Um, have DPC explode into the mindset of uh, here, in, here in the U.S. So thank you for this presentation. You guys have been, been, been very generous for empowering us. So my first question is, um, the company that assisted in navigating uh, preferred providers uh, for the DeSoto Hospital, is there, oh. would you be able to share the name of that company or are there several choices? I could tell you. 
<laughs> but I have to kill you. No. What does that uh, mean? I'm glad, to, I'm glad to speak with you about it. I'm glad to, but Lois and I were glad to talk about it. I mean, oh. we, we can do that, but I mean, this, this, this was seven years of research. I'm glad to share with you all of you. There's a little way. proprietary I, nature to some of that. And then the other two questions are, what are they, oh, yes. So I've been asked by an employer before if they would be giving up anything by turning away from the buka. And so basically I wanted to figure out how do you approach in selling that? And my analysis is it's really a change in mindset. Would you agree? So I just wanted to pick your brain on that. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll comment, I'll let Lois comment. I, I'm telling you, it takes a good advisor a good DPC and a little courage, and then a, a, a leadership that will do that. Um, you know, I get asked all the time. You know, God, you must have people lined up out the door that want to want to work with you. <laughs> Not the case. Uh, it's still difficult. I mean, these hey, you heard things your are. Accent? Do I? Where is it? What is that? I'm just easy. Hey, it's joking. Give me we, a time. We have about five more minutes and about oh, ten people queued up here. So, yeah. and, and um, we're glad to talk to all of you. Just after it's over, and yeah. I'm glad. I'll, we're I'll all glad. I'm glad to share with you yeah. because I'm helping to talk to the county and our city too, and in, in our community. Because yes, it is very difficult, and it's a lot of work, and it's not something that an employer is willing to do without really, really thinking about it. And I, I'm going to say one other thing too, and I'll say it to everybody in this room, and it's really important. Uh, the day is coming when these employers, if they think they're worried about fiduciary responsibility with retirement plans, the day is coming when some employee is going to have something done to, to one of their kids and get billed wrong in a $198,000 fractured radius and the plan pays hundred grand with a buka when we paid seven. The day's coming where the, employ the employer is going to get sued and there is a fiduciary responsibility that all of us have. Y'all have it to your patients. And we all have it, so I don't. You don't want to scare them, but I think that's an important point. And the day is coming. There's bags of money in healthcare. I think we all know that. I just wanted to mention that by creating the system that you've done, you've actually helped a lot of patients without health insurance. I'm in Fort Myers, which is about an hour south of you, sure. and I care for about 70% of my patients that have no health insurance or a high deductible plan. I had a young man who needed a gallbladder out. Our local hospital gave him a price quote of 20,000. They had him apply for care credit that he was gonna charge something like 20% interest. Um, we got him up at Arcadia Hospital for his gallbladder removal for 5,000 and his grandmother paid for it so he didn't have to take out credit. You did an amazing job and I just wanna thank you for what you've done. Thank That's you. That's awesome. So, and piggybacking on that, thanks for sharing that, that story. So, you know, a rural hospital that has incredibly small margins, if you can drive just even the tiniest amount of elective care into those facilities, first of all, a couple things happen. You change the perception of this hospital within the community because, first of all, you know, if the community is used to leaving the community for medical care and all of a sudden they see somebody from Miami coming to Arcadia for, for a colonoscopy and somebody from Fort Lauderdale coming and somebody from Fort Myers driving past four hospitals to get surgery done in Arcadia, why is that happening? And it does change the flow, it changes the perception and it really can boost up these rural hospitals. We lost over 100 rural hospitals in the United States last year. Hi, thank you so much. I'm. Uh about to start a primary care practice. I'm a pediatrician, a direct primary care practice, and I'm curious about the collaboration between family practice and pediatrics because sometimes adult docs don't want to see the children and sometimes they want to see five and up or, or whatever, and how you came about collaborating together for this and what the benefits you feel like are to the patients because they do have to do, go to different locations to see you, right? Uh, that's a very, very long answer. Um, I'll be happy to talk with you, and Dr. Hill is here somewhere too. We can chat with you together. I will share the short version. We see ages five and up in our DPC, and if a family has a child under five that wants to, uh, the family wants to sign up for DPC, but I won't see the child, that child can go to a pediatrician for standard fee-for-service copay, just like they had the, re the rest of the health plan kicks in outside of our DPC. At, at DeSoto, real critical, we literally they can go anywhere they want, and the copay was slightly higher. These copays haven't been around in 30 years as low as these copays 20 bucks, 40 bucks if they go outside. So we didn't want to limit anyone like that. We gave them all choices. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have time for two.
quick questions, and I'm sorry, but whoever is still a queue, and come on up and ask. We're, we've got we have I, time to steer around. I wanted to ask about that rural critical access hospital. Uh, the town that my practice is in has one. I used to work for them, and I left to open my DPC practice. And I've been trying to get them to see the light because they are self-funded, and, and every year they lose money, and a huge chunk of that is what they're paying for insurance. So what, what about the physicians that are still employed there, and was, what was the sort of emotional dynamic when you partner with doctors not part of the hospital? Really good question. That's a very good question because that is also a something that we had to consider because being a hospital, we uh, value all of our physicians and extenders, um, whether they're employed or not. Uh, they're part of our community and part of our health care. And so that was something we had to seriously consider um, on how the non-direct primary care physicians were going to uh, embrace this or accept it, I guess, not embrace, but accept. Um, and our CEO literally went and spoke to them and explained the financial um, situation of the facility and what our philosophy is and that, no, we are not going to, you know, if, if, if our employee loves you, doc, they're going to stay there and their plan really isn't staying, isn't changing much for them. You know, so it's not going to, we're not penalizing them. We just enhanced the plan for the DPC. So we did not penalize them from the plan we had for keeping their old, um, their other provider. So it, it, it's something that you would have to work with your consultant and um, and your CEO has to be a good politician. Yes, and your CEO has to be a good politician because yeah. it, it, it is challenging. You, yeah. you had a very good question. Last question. A uh, big hit if uh, one of those employers uh, uh, cancels a contract. Did you put in like a three-month notice or some sort of protection for the DPC? I can tell you on our side we signed a three-year contract. Wow. Good work. I thought it was ten. Yeah, no, we, we, I mean, we would not have, uh, we would not have invested the kind of resources we did into this community to expand unless we had a long-term commitment from the employer. So we signed a three-year contract.